Welcome to the Porch Roof Classic, a retro baseball podcast novel in 15 or so episodes by Jeff Pullman. Episode 9 Summer slogged into the final week of July. The Danny dilemma lodged in me like a kidney stone. The Sox were ten and a half out, so most of our fandom was reduced to seeing how many homers Yaz could hit, but that didn't even matter. I was so swallowed up by my tormentor as evil freckles stayed in my eyes every time my head hit the pillow. I thought about asking Mom and Dad for advice, but that didn't seem right with it being my mom's birthday on Friday and all. No one loved a birthday celebration more than Mom. She had a knack for getting one friend after another to take her to lunch, turning the actual day into an annual week-long Shirley Fest. Before we knew it, Friday was on us, and we had our annual reservations at Le Curtain, West Springfield's version of Dinner Theater. Mom wore her favorite sequin dress that she saved for either Le Curtain or Oscar telecasts. Dad picked one of his moccasin suits, while me and Robbie were forced into sport jackets for what was always three hours of schlocky, painful songs and a dinner that tasted like recycled bar mitzvah food. This year, the Connecticut River musical players, who performed the same show in Hartford and Middletown, were doing Guys and Dolls. Mom insisted I sit next to her and across from Robbie at our little round table and was so sure the show was going to wow me. It's about gamblers and gangsters in 1930s New York, she said, giving my shoulder a squeeze. Right up your alley. Yeah, but there's songs in it. Oh, stop. They called our main course Chicken Kiev, but it was closer to a Swanson TV dinner, lukewarm and covered with so many breadcrumbs it was hard to find the actual chicken. The actors were local talent, most of them familiar from their abomination of Brigadoon I was dragged to the previous year and their New York accents were forced and embarrassing. The orchestra they unfortunately sang along to was off to the left under an exit sign, a lady at a piano wearing a white chiffon dress and ten pounds of makeup, a fourteen-year-old drummer and an overweight guy with thick glasses, long hair, mutton chops, and a weak saxophone. They had also been the orchestra for Brigadoon, and I got the idea they were all part of the same reclusive family. There were some funny lines and bouncy, flatly played songs in the first half, and I liked Nathan Detroit's character, but Robbie seemed to be in a coma, and I couldn't wait for intermission so I could do a quick trip to the crowded bathroom with him. Like the show? I asked him at the urinals. Stupid and boring, he replied. Our mom was loving every minute, of course, and the moment I sat back down, she threw her arm around me, cheap French perfume wafting into my nose. Frank Sinatra and Marlon Brando were in the movie version, you know. Really? Uh Uh-huh. It had a bit more pizzazz than this, but I think they're doing a good job here. The girl has nice teeth, and the conflict is good. Can't have a good story without that. Right. I poked what was left of the chicken on my dirty plate, which no one had bothered to come around and pick up. I kind of have a conflict going on myself. What? With that girl? No, no, with Danny Blight. He wants to play wiffle ball with us. Oh, she removed her arm, mainly to take another sip from her wine glass. Isn't that good? No, it could be awful. I have no clue why he wants to do something fun with us this summer, because because maybe he does. I don't know. To him, having fun is terrorizing someone, at least the last few years. Not sure what he was like in elementary school before he moved here. Well, however rude he is, I'm sure he gets it from his parents. I can do without either of them. Jane Blight went to lunch with some of us once at Canterbury's and took over the whole conversation. Dad returned just then from a chat with a very drunk Bert Siegel up the aisle, mopping his brow. Man, talk about a motor mouth. Both of my parents apparently had issues with people who talked a lot, and it's what made us different from a lot of Jewish families I'd met. Ones from the New York area seemed to fill every quiet second with yakking, but my folks were strictly New England born and bred, and a lot more reserved. It didn't have much of an effect on Robbie, but it certainly dripped down to me. Gene Remar was my friend for a good three years before he even knew I was Jewish. Should we share this Danny problem with your father? Mom whispered to me. Uh, no, I mean, not yet. Maybe over the weekend. 
The West Springfield Musical Players Orchestra launched into their intro number for Act Two just then, and Mom patted my arm to let me know the conversation was over. My mother once had hopes of becoming a Broadway star, but her theater class at her Providence High School was underfunded and less than inspiring. By the time she was free to attend a drama-friendly college, her father lost his job and she met Phil at her bakery job, and that was that. Luck Be a Lady Tonight was belted out off-key by one of the West Springfield players in a wrinkled pinstripe suit, and Mom nudged me to sing along with her to every lyric. She had a better voice than the actor. When we got home later, I climbed into bed, with Robbie already snoring in his, and picked up my copy of War of the Worlds again for the first time in days. A note fell out of the book. It was nice snoogling with you tonight, even without an icy house. 24 Grove Avenue, South Hadley. So write me. H. I stared at the slip of paper, which was torn off a flowered sticky notepad my mom kept on the refrigerator. How did this get into my book? Then it all became clear. While I was fast asleep the other night, imagining I was paying Helen a nocturnal visit in dreamland, she had snuck upstairs in the sometime before dawn, written a note, and slipped it into my bedside paperback. It took me forever to get to sleep after reading the thing. All I could think about was how different my Saturday was about to be and how I could possibly pull off the scheme I had in mind. Good that I got today off of work, was the first thing out of my mouth at breakfast. Why's that? asked Mom and dropped a second slice of French toast on my plate with her spatula. Oh, because Izzy wants to take the bus downtown with me. Go to Record Barn and Gerson's. Probably have lunch somewhere. Maybe dinner. She stood there and gave me a sideways glance. I half expected her to twirl a spatula and drop it into a holster. You don't have any lawns to mow? I did a bunch last weekend, remember? She half nodded and returned to the stove, which was easier for her than trying to remember. Haven't been to Gerson's for months, I said, and now that I got some spending money from Irv's, well, that must feel good. You bet it does. Izzy was at a southern Connecticut beach with his folks that day, but knew about my plan, and assumed I would share any intimate details of my upcoming safari. The pocket of my jean shorts bulged with chain, and 35 cents got me onto the smelly local bus at the end of Squaw Farm Road. Twenty minutes later, I was on Main Street in downtown Springfield. It wasn't much of a downtown. A couple of big old department stores, pawn shops, seedy bars, and a handful of shuttered movie palaces that had been converted into bargain shoe or jewelry outlets. Gerson's bookstore was a few blocks north, and I hurried toward it. Gerson's was a perfect alibi destination because I practically brought a tent and sleeping bag every time I went there. The main part of the store was old and stuffy, dapper, immobile Mr. Gerson, who seemed to have been born in an olive green suit with a yellow silk handkerchief tucked into its pocket, stood beside the bestseller display from ten until five and surveyed his efficient main floor. He also didn't like kids and would always eyeball us when we strolled through to the rear door, where Nirvana awaited. Across the alley, Gerson's second-hand bookshop loomed two stories high, tucked away from the main store like a bastard child. It never disappointed. Stacks and stacks of used paperbacks, bins and bins of used record albums, with the treasure trove, a floor-to-ceiling, aisle-long shelf of old magazines at usually no more than a quarter apiece. For rabid baseball fans like me and Izzy, it was a bottomless candy store. That morning, Mr. Brick Gerson gave me his usual nostril flare as I passed, and before long I was walking across the alley, up the stairs, and rummaging through suites. This time, with a longer bus ride around the corner, I chose three items. A baseball digest from 1962 with Cleveland's Dick Donovan on the cover. Pitching moments they remember. A 1964 Street and Smith's yearbook featuring shiny teeth Sandy Koufax, but marred with a couple of food stains and a used kid's baseball novel called Fast Man on a Pivot, one of a series by someone named Dwayne Decker about a fictional team called the Blue Sox. The haul set me back $4.38, but I still had a fresh 20 in my wallet that would cover the other leg of my journey. Green Gerson's bag under my arm, I hiked six more blocks north, under train tracks and under a highway overpass to the Peter Pan bus terminal. 
Check departure times for the SPFD to AMH route. Paid $9 for the ticket and just made it on board before having to wait another two hours. I had two seats to myself, the bus sparsely populated by an old man, backpacker, and a gaggle of college girls, no doubt heading to Mount Holyoke, UMass, Hampshire, Amherst, or Smith. It being summer, they were without books, but area students often headed up to the five college area to visit friends and party. I was drunk on Street and Smith's 1964 American League pennant predictions, which, of course, had the Yankees winning, picked for first place every season since my dad was born, and a sad, accurate prognosis for my Boston's. The bus crossed the river and wound its way up into the low hills past Mount Tom, and by the time I looked up from my magazine, again, a half hour later, we were off the highway and rolling through the cozy little town of South Hadley. Mount Holyoke College dominated the place, but it still had a quaint little main street with cutesy, overpriced shops catering to students' parents. I found a gas station, asked where Grove Avenue was, and began to walk. It was at least a mile from the center of town, down Route 116 past two-story, tree-shrouded colonials, a flurry of ranch houses, and a few pastoral fields luring my eyes to a green horizon. 24 Grove Avenue, on the other hand, was a small, featureless gray house across from a small garage called Duane's Brakes and Mufflers. It had an overgrown yard, no car in its uncovered driveway, and some plastic kids' toys that appeared to be abandoned around the side. Puzzled, I walked up and rang the doorbell. I heard soft footsteps. Someone looked through a peephole at me, paused a long time, and finally opened the door. Helen stood there with a shocked and delirious grin, barely recognizable. Her hair was a fright. There were sleepless circles under her eyes, and she wore a man's flannel shirt that was two sizes too big on her. She only had panties on underneath, but gave me a big hug anyway. Well, hot damn! Looks like you got my after-hours note. I had a day off, so thought, uh, why not? Accomplished! She ducked out on the front steps in her skimpy outfit, made a fruitless try to pull the shirt down over her exposed, marginally hairy legs. Place is a total mess. Otherwise, I'd invite you in. Oh, who cares? You should see my room. I did, remember? She winked. Okay, hang loose out here a sec. She ducked back in, shut the door on me, and I could hear her frantically putting some order into the place, saying me and Bobby McGee while she worked. After what seemed like an eternity, she threw the door back open. Ta-da! She still had the big flannel on, but had added denim overalls to the mix and attempted a quick brush of her uncontrollable hair. Most of the house seemed to be taken up by one big living room, with a black, cheap leather couch in front of a huge Zenith TV. Have a seat. You want a drink? Um, maybe, yeah. Okay, let me see what there is. I moved to the couch and sat down. A table beside me had a stack of turned-over framed photos on it. I flipped two or three of them over. All were vacation pics of a young couple with their two kids, a bushy mustache on Dad, shag haircuts for all, and assorted New England beaches behind them. Who's this? I asked, as Helen returned from the small kitchen with a can of tab. A lame old family that lived here before us. They're like half moved out. Is your aunt around? Phyllis? Uh-uh. Got a nurse job in Northampton the first day we were here, so I've hardly seen her. She dropped next to me on the couch, looked me over. Everything cool, fool? Yep. So what'd you do, take the bus? How'd you know? She snorted a laugh. Because I figured you didn't hitch. Too bad. It's as easy as breathing around here. Yeah, look, I'm sorry if you're busy or something. I just like to surprise people. Once I had a buddy who moved out to Stockbridge, and I got Mom and Dad to stop at his house when we were driving around on a leaf peeping. So what you want to do? I wasn't ready for that question. Shrugged awkwardly. I don't know. Hang out? Maybe get a little tour of South Hadley? Big yawn. Not much there except Mount Debutant College. We can always walk to a farm, see a cow get born. Uh, I'll pass on that. You don't like debutantes? She nudged me with another wink. Cows are more interesting, believe me. So what else is up with you? Actually... There's this jerky, horrible kid named Danny who wants to join our wiffle ball league, and I'm not sure if... What? You have a league of that stuff? Sort of, yeah. Just started one anyway, so I was hoping to ask you about it. Well, not now. Hearing about a jerky, horrible kid will just mess my head up. Let's take a hike. Really? 
There's trails around here? There's a trail almost everywhere, Joey. And if there isn't one, you make your own. We discovered ours after hitchhiking three miles up a two-lane road, thanks to a toothy farm lady in a Dodge pickup loaded with vegetables. I told you it was easy, blurted Helen as we hopped from the cramped cab. It was just a narrow path into the woods on the other side of a thick chain, a chain Helen instantly climbed over after ignoring a no trespassing sign. Where would we be now if famous explorers refused to ever trespass? Yeah, like Christopher Columbus. Ugh, not him. He was an Indian hater who didn't even land in the right place. I was thinking Magellan or that Yosemite guy, John Muir. The path quickly narrowed further as it wound up and down through a leafy jungle and became harder to recognize. Twice we turned the wrong way, only to hit path blocks of dead, hollowed-out tree trunks. Not making this very easy for us, are they? I said. What do you mean, they? It's not like there's a South Hadley hiking path commission or anything. Though I do always wonder how these old paths got built in the first place. Like, did the pilgrims bring machetes and little steamrollers with them? I laughed. The sun threw the tree canopy angled into late afternoon, and I was already anxious about getting home for dinner. How come you're so quiet, Joey? No reason. Just wondered how long we want to hike, I guess. Until we get to something. There's always something to get to on a hike, right? Mosquitoes were starting to get to me, and despite the humidity, I was suddenly sorry I picked shorts instead of overalls like Helen wore. The sort of path finally leveled out, and about thirty yards ahead, trees on the left side gave way to some kind of clearing. Is that what I think? Helen cried, picking up her pace. The path suddenly dissolved into a wide slope of tall grass as we came upon a small lake, or actually a big pond. Bugs skipped along its placid surface. We could hear frogs croak on lily pads by the far bank. A ye old swimming hole, Helen cried. I can't believe it. Pretty cool. You up for a dip or what? She had already unsnapped the side of her overalls. Well, I didn't bring a suit. So? So I've never swum that way. What way? You know. Believe me, it's five times better. Didn't you see the new movie about the Woodstock concert? Uh, no. Doesn't it have an R rating? Well, you'll have to sneak in then. Wait, I, I thought you never saw movies. Well, that one I had to, seriously. The Who, Joe Cocker, Ten Years After, Jefferson Airplane, Jimi Hendrix, Joan Baez, plus cool skinny dipping scenes? I was still afraid to move. Her overalls were off, and she'd already started on her shirt. Come on, man. We survived camp fascism together. All we're going to do is swim. What if it's cold? She stared at me. Then your nuts will turn into acorns for a few minutes. Big freaking deal. She saw I was still hesitant. Don't worry, Joey. I won't look if you won't. I half nodded, turned my back to pull my t-shirt off. But there was no way I wasn't going to peek. How could I tell Izzy we went skinny dipping without reporting some of the details? I heard a loud splash behind me and then a whoop. Pretending to work a crick in my neck and slightly turn my head, I caught a glimpse of her white boobs as she backstroked a little, then dove below and flashed a bit of matching white butt. She was exotically pretty all over, and it struck me how forbidden we keep nakedness so much of the time, leading to things like Izzy leaving his uncle's house on Passover with three issues of Playboy shoved down the front of his slacks. Ahem! Helen shouted. She had surfaced, spit some murky water out of her mouth. I still only had my shirt off dropped my shorts and underpants in less than three seconds, slipped on the wet grass and fell into the lake. Helen cracked up, and I quickly dog paddled over to splash her head. She splashed back a few times, then dove under again. The water wasn't cold, but felt slimier than Camp Muckle Lake, if that was possible. Pretty gross. You think there's snakes in here? As long as there's no alligators. My mom found a baby one in her toilet down in Florida once. You're kidding. I never kid. Kid! splashed me in the face. I got her back and we spent the next minute in close water combat. Truce! Truce! She finally yelled, grabbed both of my arms. Beneath the dark, tepid water, I could feel the points of her breasts tickling my chest. She felt it too, stayed motionless for a few more awkward, exciting seconds, then let go of my arms and swam away again, like it had never happened. I wonder if there's a little river on the other side, I shouted. Maybe we can swim home. Doubt it. 
I headed left to lean on a small log that lay in the water. The second I dropped my arm on it and broke off a piece of bark, there was a dark movement in the air and a weird, high-pitched sound. Shit! Mosquitoes! They came from nowhere and were everywhere. Bit my face, my neck, went up my nose. I cursed again and dove under the surface. Bobbed back up a few yards away. They were following me. Helen turned, swam back like an Olympian. Knocked as many of them off me as she could, but it was hopeless. We paddled side by side, back to the bank, hopped out and used our clothes to swat them away. Wow, you got bites all over your butt, she said. You're not supposed to look. Oops, and then we both laughed and rapidly dressed. Nothing serious other than a bug invasion had happened, but I felt I'd grown up a bit more. As a tribute to Robbie's hives, I itched every inch of myself all the way back to town, and the two college boys who picked us up wanted to drive me to an emergency room until Helen lectured some sense into them. They left us on College Street in South Hadley, where Helen entered a drugstore and either bought or lifted a tube of something called Bite Be Gone, sat me on a bench outside and rubbed the gooey junk on every red bump she could find until I had to snatch the stuff away from her. The bus back to Springfield wasn't due for another 45 minutes, so she took me around the corner to an old working man's diner called Ed's, and we sat at the counter for hot dogs and ice cream floats. Or at least, I had the hot dog. She sent hers back when Ed couldn't tell her what it was made from, and went with a grilled cheese and tomato instead. We took stools at the far end of the counter so the stench of the bite begone would gag fewer customers. When my dog arrived, I asked Helen to hand me the mustard, and she gave me something unexpected with it. Now about that kid, huh? The jerky one you started telling me about before. Let him play whistle ball with you and see what happens. Are you serious? Hey, you asked, I thought about it, and that's what I think. Life's tough, but it'll just mess you up even more if you run away from shit. Remember what I said at archery? Kick fears ass. Her grilled cheese arrived, and she attacked it before the waiter even pulled his hand away. My dad was a professor at Harvard, mathematics, which probably explains why I hated geometry. Anyway, good old Myron Fishblatt couldn't keep his pistol in his holster, you know. Eventually met some Norwegian grad student and moved to Oslo when I was seven. Damn. Exactly. I've been damning the schmuck ever since. Think I was going to spend the rest of my life looking for him, though? No way. Didn't even want to live with my mom in Florida, probably because it was Florida, and because she spent half of every day cursing the guy. Who needs that? So wasn't that like running away? She washed down the first half of her sandwich with ice water. Yeah, a little. But what was that? that was tougher not to, because he was my dad. This Danny jerk is just a town creep who can't do anything to you. I say dance with him. Fifteen minutes later, she gave me a long, kiss-free hug as the southbound Peter Pan rolled into town. When I finally remembered to ask for her phone number, she said, How about I just call you again? I'm out a lot. Mom and Dad half noticed when I walked in the house at 8.15 and thankfully missed my bite-begone scars. They just wanted to confirm I'd eaten dinner, and Sylvie's grinders on the south end of Main Street worked fine for that answer. Robbie was glued to the Sox game on his bedside radio. Losing eight to nothing to the crappy angels. Romo sucked and Nagy was even worse. But I had a new mission in mind and grabbed the phone book from a low cabinet in the hallway, found the listing for Blight on Collier Street, and dialed after bracing myself. Danny's mother answered the phone and asked who was calling. Her voice was a little broken and she seemed upset. Um, a friend from school. Just a minute. I suddenly had a warm, grippy sensation in my throat as I waited for Danny. Hello? Over the phone, he sounded far less harmless. Hi, Danny. It's Joey Tosh. Well, now. Yeah, I just wanted to let you know. We had a team meeting about you playing with us and decided to invite you to our next practice. I could almost see him grin through the wires. Gotta hand it to you, Tosh. You're actually a stand-up little guy. But hold on. You actually practice fairy ball? Yeah. Sometimes, but if you come, no calling it fairy ball anymore, okay? Hmm, I suppose I could live with that. And no cheating either. Oh, so you have rules? Yeah, only one, and it's no cheating. There was a long pause. I was waiting for another smart aleck answer, but he didn't say a word. Tuesday at 12.30 in my backyard, okay? Sure, I'm bubbly and excited already. He hung up, and I allowed the nerves in my throat to settle down.
You've been listening to The Porch Roof Classic by Jeff Pullman. This retro baseball podcast novel was made possible by Spotify for Podcasters and Buzzsprout. Be sure to basket catch another episode next week. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to contribute, go to buymeacoffee.com slash jpolman54v. Thanks.